All right, employees, gather around. I just got back from the most successful trade show slash convention ever. We're going to have a four-hour meeting about all the changes that I'm going to make to the store. I've got notes. I listen to professional speakers for a week. This is going to be great. We're going to put a bounce house over here. We're going to have a painting station over here. Maybe we're going to bring in some clowns. I've got Lego kits that I'm going to use, and this is going to be awesome. And then they all left. So today we're going to talk about how we take the information that we gleaned from wherever we went professionally. We decided we were going to do an outing or we were going to go somewhere to get some education about how to retail better, uh, whether that's a gamma trade show or it's a, 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 an open house or Astra or many, any of the any other places where we can go for professional networking and education in our industry space, Gen Con, maybe um, at New York Toy Fair when that happens. And how do we take those ideas and then transition them into something that's workable inside the store itself? So welcome to episode five of Game Retail Ramblings. I'm your host, Travis Severance, and I'm coming to you from Millennium Game Studios today in Deja Vu. It feels like Rochester, New York. Uh, I've been in Louisville, Kentucky for Gamma. A trade show all this week. I left around 6 a.m. on Sunday uh, so I could catch a Shopify presentation which was super critical because we're looking at transitioning to Shopify. Uh, I gave a presentation to new publishers about free RPG day and why it should matter to you. Some of you may or may not know, but I'm one of the principal donors for gaming days, LLC. Uh, the primary event that we host every single year now is called free RPG day. Uh, kits are available at free RPG Uh, so let's see what's on my agenda at the show today. So, I have a, a, a WizKids meeting about Free RPG Day today. I've got a talk with some Asmodee executives about some new directions that they're going in. There's a booth that I'm going to be at on the floor where I'm going to discuss Free RPG Day with retailers and publishers and have some conversations with distributors as well. Uh, at the end of the night, it looks like I've got a mixer that I'm attending with the op, formerly known as USAopoly, which is probably just to show some of their their new catalogs and stuff. And in the middle of that, I've got three or four different half hour meetings about various different things. Some of it's my consultation stuff. Some of it's a new publisher that wants to talk to me about ideas. Uh, so episode four was all about how to pick the games. Episode three was all about how to get something out of the trade show. Today's episode is going to be all about how you take those ideas that you have and bring them back and implement them in your store successfully without uh, making too many changes too fast, without uh, deciding to swim in different waters that maybe you're not comfortable to swim in, how do you take everything you learned, process it in a certain way to make sure that it's something that you can actually use and get value out of um, moving forward? So we're going to get into what we like to call a top seven here which for those of you that tuned in for any of the previous episodes, one through four, uh, I use top seven a lot. Uh, this is in no particular order, but I'm going to talk about the top seven ways that I implement things that I learned in a successful way so that it makes sense for my business and my employees don't want to kill me and I get some value out of that. Uh, number one is know what your store is. And what I mean by that is it's very easy to go to a trade show, whether it's, you know, the New York Toy Fair at Astra or, or the New York Toy Fair at, at the Javits Center or it's, it's Gen Con in Indianapolis or uh, Gamma in Louisville, Kentucky, and see the bright lights and all the wonderment that's there for the game industry and get an idea about all these different ways that you're going to diversify your store and you're going to bring in new customers. You've listened to a a retailer that's successful up in front of you talk about diversity as the way that you save yourself from falling markets and so on and so forth. And while that's true, most of us came into this with something that we were passionate about, and then there's a whole other industry around us. So what I would say is, if I'm a card game store primarily, and I watched a fantastic miniatures game presentation, or I watched a really exciting role-playing game uh, release or launch, or I, I, I talk to a publisher about that, or, you know, board games is really uh, top of mind now, and I want to bring in some other customers. Thinking about that decision all the way through as far as what the customer's expectation is, 
you have to sort of start at the finish. So if you're a CCG store, you have CCG singles, you've got binders, you've got sleeves, you've got deck boxes, you've got tables for play, that sort of thing. And you decide just for the hell of it, you're going to throw a Games Workshop bestsellers rack on the wall, and this thing's going to generate the revenue that they told you it was going to generate. There's a whole nother layer of retailing that you have to be understanding of, which is there's paints, there's terrain, there's space that you're going to need if you're going to host events. How are you going to leverage this product line in the right way? The same thing with board games. Board games are big and heavy and clunky and they're sort of all over the place. And if you don't own the category in your space, in your second place when it comes to board games, you might as well be in last place and that sort of thing. So when you need to know your store and understand what your store is and who your customers are and what you're good at, you want to stick to the things that you're good at and maybe get outside of the periphery just a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And you have to have the benefit of space to be able to do that a lot of times. That said, that doesn't mean that you have to throw diversity out of the window because if you're a card game store, you can diversify into other card games. You know all about card games. You know selling card games. Let's say you're primarily a magic store and you decide that Pokemon is something you're going to sell. Or you decide that Yu-Gi-Oh is something you're going to sell. Learning to sell another card game is a heck of a lot easier than trying to bring in airbrushes or deciding that you're going to get into Lego randomly. And, and there are times when I go into stores and I look at the product mix that they have and it's a bit of a head scratch because I can tell that they're a card store and they have this rack of board games that they feel like they have to have. And it hasn't been gardened in years, and it's dusty, or it doesn't have any of the new release titles, or there's nobody there that's obviously ordering from that. It's actually a detriment to the store because it's taking away from your, your actual focus, which is card games, and you're, you're, you're trying to do that really well. And any board game customer that walks in and sees that thing says, I'm never coming back again. They, they don't, they're, this isn't a board game store. This is a card game store that happens to have some board games on the rack. So, like, save yourself the headache, and if you're going to diversify because you don't want to be – um, tied to any one brand, try to diversify within that brand. The same thing is if you're a miniature store. If you're a miniature store and Games Workshop is the straw that, straw that stirs the drink, which they are right now, if you're going to go somewhere else and you don't want to have to be a Games Workshop store only, stay. try to stay within that realm because the customers that are coming in already are going to be customers that you know how to service, you know how to focus, you've got glues, you've got paints, you've got all the different stuff that they need to be able to 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 accessorize and paint and complete their armies and that sort of thing. So it's important when you come back that you evaluate what your store is, what kind of store you could potentially become is the thing you're adding on something that's adjacent. So if I was a miniature store and I had a whole wall of, of Reaper miniatures and I had a bunch of Frostgrave that I was selling and I had WizKids unpainted and I decided, you know what I want to do because it doesn't take up a lot of space and I can get a lot of density there and I can own the category in my area because nobody does it well, is sell board games or sell role-playing games, great. You've already got some of those customers there. You've got miniatures that they can accessorize. Dice are pretty easy to bring in. You don't need a huge display of those to know that you've got, you know, you can get fit a couple hundred dice in a, in a pretty easy display. And role-playing stuff is is doesn't take up a lot of space you can you can display it library style and it's pretty easy to own the category because most people in your area i promise are only focused on at most dungeons and dragons and pathfinder and there's a whole world of wonderful beautiful role-playing games outside of dungeons and dragons and pathfinder so number one is know your store uh, number two is know your customer base and i touched on that before where your store is located, who your customers are as far as shoppers go is going to dictate some of that as well. Um, you know your customers better than I know them. I could I could talk about what your customer base might look like if, if I knew where you were located, but I don't know anything about your area without going in there and doing a deep dive as far as population and you know average income and house size and that sort of thing as far as what's going to be good and what's going to be bad in those areas. So understand that if you bring in a bunch there have been times when i've come back from trade shows and i brought in lines of product and i've had customers go what's happening around here um the year that we came back from a trade show and we decided that we were going to go uh both feed in on disc golf in our store uh certainly was a head scratcher for a lot of the regular customers that came in and knew us as a game store for you know a decade or so and could not understand why we we're putting these Frolf frisbees in what are 
what is this disc craft and Innova? Uh, what, why is it taking up space in the in the in the game store and that sort of thing? So, be able to have some sort of a presentation that you can give to those customers when you decide to go off the beaten path a little bit. Now, disc golf is something that we've carried successfully for the last ten years. Uh, it's it's a really dense product line. You can fit a lot of dollars on the shelf in a really tight space. And if you look around your your local area, you've probably got at least six disc golf courses that you didn't even know existed if you hadn't played disc golf. And disc golf is a is a pretty easy thing to get into if you have a golf or if you have a if you have a game store. Uh, number three is get an idea of growth area potential. So what I was talking about when I was talking about knowing your store is if you are going to diversify and you're going to go down the rabbit hole of deciding to get into something else and carrying in a new, a new product line, there's not only the product investment of whatever that is, whether it's board games, role-playing games, miniature games, another card game, it's also the marketing budget to let other people know that you're carrying it because if you're bringing in a new product line or a new category, the thought process behind that shouldn't be that I'm going to sell this to my existing customer base that I already have. It should be that I'm going to bring in new customers to my store to take a look at something else that, that they don't already have because the customers that you have already have a budget and they're spending whatever that discretionary budget is. Now, that's not to say that they don't get excited and spend a little bit more uh, a month if there's something that they really like, but the reality of it is you want to bring more visits into your store. The, the, the game store, the most successful game stores in the country are the ones that give people reason to visit every day. Uh, a lot of times that starts with the event space. Sometimes that starts with your products. Occasionally that starts with our marketing why would they want to walk into my store? More visits equal more dollars, equal more conversions, equal more customers, equal more word of mouth. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a difficult calculation to know that the more people that come in their store, the more opportunities you have to sell product. So when you're bringing in a new line or you're deciding that you're going to engage in something that's, that's different or that's off the beaten path, start with the finish. This is what success looks like and then work your way backwards. And there's marketing that needs to go in that. You need to let other customers know. You need to understand what those customers are going to be when they come in your door. And you need to understand how to adapt your store in a way where they feel like they have their own space. One of the ways that we failed, that I failed as a store owner, was when I brought in comics. I brought in comics. I thought it was the next natural step. There was a gentleman that owned a comic book store about three miles from our place. And he had the business and it was successful for about 20 years. He passed away. I spoke with his brother. His brother said he wasn't going to continue the business. They were just looking to sell off the stock, and they were going to exit the category. Well, for my area, it left this huge void when it comes to comic books. There's three colleges that are close by. Um, college students don't typically have a ton of money, but a comic book is a micro-purchase that they do on a consistent basis, and if they're leaving their home area, then they're going to want a, a, an area where they can get their issues and keep up with their issues when they get back, so on and so forth. I... I failed to service the comic book customer because I didn't realize how important it was for them to feel like they had their own space. And what I mean by that is comic book people, like everything else, like to have areas where they go where they can specifically nerd out about comic books. And the way that my store was set up and the way that my store was laid out, the comic book sort of lived in a space just north of the, the new release section. It wasn't its own area. It didn't have its own thing. It, of course, was displayed in a way, and we had plenty of stock and that sort of thing. But it didn't give them their own like little vibe and their own little nook where they could just hang out, talk comics. I had only a couple of people on staff that were really comic book nerds. So depending on the day of the week when they came in, if they were buying on that day, then I didn't have a comic book nerd to talk about that kind of stuff. So, I mean, there were a bunch of other things that, that, that went wrong with comics for us and part of the reason why we, we stopped carrying them. But some of that had to do with, you know, despite the fact that I identified that there was, a, there was definitely an opening and, a, and an opportunity in the market. And, you know, Marvel movies at the time were super hot and Walking Dead was doing its thing and there were all these other opportunities. So I put together the best idea that I could possibly have. I didn't realize what those sort of customers wanted. Now, I did a tour of all the local comic book areas, but getting a feel for what the vibe is in that store and what the customers want from that store is very different than what a game store is specifically. Now there's a lot of comic book slash game stores in our industry and they do really well because there's a, 
there's a nice marrying of the two and I can understand how, how that could work. But the way that I set my store up initially for that was not in a way that was going to be successful. And I couldn't see it until I started it. And I couldn't see it from the other places because that wasn't something that I was going to glean until I actually tried to put that into practice. Uh, number four is start with easy things. So the first three things were sort of some high level breakdown stuff things that you want to chew on, things that you want to prepare for, things that you want to mull around and and make some decisions on. Start with the easy thing. So if you go to a seminar and you're listening to somebody talk about how to merchandise your store or different ways to get more from your displays or uh, power displays, setting up categories to be successful, that sort of thing, and you come back to your store and in order to emulate what that speaker was telling you about those specific things, all you got to do is move around some furniture. That's a pretty low hanging fruit thing. You know, if it's, I learned about uh, a new line of supplies that I didn't know about before that can supplement this other line of supplies that I have. And it's only going to be a couple hundred bucks that I got to place an order with my rep to bring that in, to have that in for the weekend. That's a pretty low, easy thing to do. Like deciding to carry your second, um, company of dice outside of Chessex or Q Workshop or something like that, that's pretty easy. You're going to get into the catalog. You're going to take a swing with what you think is going to be important and what you think is going to matter to your customers. And you're going to bring that sort of thing in. Those, those things are simple. That's not, we've decided we're going to become a miniature store or we've decided what we're going to do is we're going to go heavy on role-playing games. Those things where it's just accessorizing the things that you've already done, or maybe it's, uh, yeah, it's time to clean up the, the, uh, event space. We're going to get some new tables. I'm going to get online. I talked to a retailer from, you know, North Carolina. They've got a great deal on these tables. Um, I want to get rid of all these gross white lifetime tables that I have. So let's sell these as best we can as used or put them up on Facebook marketplace. Let's get a hold of the place and get the, get the tables ordered. That sort of stuff is pretty easy. Giving yourself the opportunity to make some quick changes like that, change your signage, maybe get signage or, or appropriate signage or effective signage. Those things are pretty simple to do too, as far as making adjustments to your store that can have a big impact, not take a lot of time, that sort of thing. Try to knock some of those out in the beginning, because if you're anything like I am, when I come back and I listen to a lot of professionals talk about the different things they do, and you've got all these ideas and I'm scribbling them down in a notepad and I'm going over them when I'm on a plane and I'm having different conversations with retailers while I'm there, There's so much stuff that's in my head that I just want to dump it all out when I get back home. Uh, Starting with the easy stuff and finding those to be successful is is really effective because you can see the little wins happen immediately. And the same thing comes from, you know, when you're going to make a decision to just expand on something else or you're going to bring in a new a new product line, the least the least financially impactful ones are the ones that you want to look at first. So. If it costs a little and your value is going to be a lot, then start with that. So if you find number six is act now to not miss a deal. So what I mean by that is you're going to go to Gamma or you're going to go to a show or you're going to go to a convention and there's going to be some sort of, uh, they've got some kind of a bundle or they've got some kind of a discount or they've got some kind of a, 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 a buying tease that's part of their brand. And usually they'll give you a week or two weeks, or maybe it's three weeks after the show to be able to get that order processed and and get those in. Do that. If you're going to save yourself 5% or you're going to get demo copies, or you're going to get some sort of a display, or you're going to get some, some extra spiff for doing the thing, make sure that you don't get home and get yourself so focused on, you know, the employees that you need to hire or who you need to fire, who you need to let go or this or that or the other thing that you don't get the immediacy things taken care of. So sit down in front of your computer, get back to all the people that you talked to that had actual buying deals. Typically the, the catalog that they give you at the show is going to have a layout of the people that have the deals, scan through those deals, circle those ones, highlight those ones, put stars next to it and figure out exactly what those things are that you need to act now, because you don't want to, you don't want to miss it. Now, if you do miss it, most of the time, the publishers, depending on the size of the publisher will allow you the same deal a week after that, but just, just get that thing done. So make sure that you're acting now. The same thing with follow-ups too. If, if there's, 
if there's retailers that you've met, if there's publishers you met, you've got business cards, there's somebody that you want that's part of your professional network, just send an email or send a text if that's the level of relationship that you've gotten to with them and say, hey, man, it was really nice hanging out and it was it was it was good talking shop. You know, where's the next place that I'm going to see you at? Or um, I had a question about X or Y or it was really nice making the connection. Do you mind if I friend you on Facebook and then take it from there? So follow up on not only the product follow ups, but follow up on the personal stuff, too. The biggest thing, the thing that I've been the most successful at in this industry has been growing my professional network inside of the gaming industry. There's very few people in this industry at companies that I order from that I don't have some sort of a relationship with that I can't get a hold of and find out why things are the way that they are. And more often than not, when I'm reading through retail forums or I'm seeing frustrations from retailers, it has to do with their inability to have communication directly with people that they care about or that they're concerned with. So being able to have a face and have somebody that you can get a hold of to get some clarity outside of whatever's going on in the retail world sort of helps. I'm not saying that it's going to make you happy. I, I certainly had a publisher that dropped a, a, a frustrating situation on me uh, at the end of the last weekend. It put me in a really tough spot professionally. It was something that kind of blindsided me and caught me off guard. So even if you have a professional network, that doesn't mean that, that you're absolved from that, that you don't have to put your own armor on or figure out your own thing. You're still going to have to deal with some frustration. And, and there's going to be times when there's business decisions that are made by publishing partners, distribution partners that are not going to align with exactly what your business does. And the reality of it is, in many cases, that's not their job. Their job is to do the best thing that they can possibly do for their company. It's not to make you the most successful retailer on the planet. So when we look at the business decisions that people made, giving them the grace to be able to handle that thing um, and respect the fact that everything that they do isn't going to line up with your business, but it's what they think is most successful for theirs, uh, makes things easier. Because the industry, believe it or not, is pretty small, and you don't want to have the reputation of being somebody that just lights up and goes wild out on social media when it comes to certain things um, that you're disappointed or frustrated with. So that was number six. Number seven is, did I accomplish my goals for the show? So way back in episode three, we talked about defining goals for what's successful for when you go to a trade show. What did you put down on a piece of paper? What did you type to yourself? What, what ideas did you have when you left your store and you've decided to invest time in yourself and time in the business by leaving the business to go out in the wild and see what they have to offer? So hold yourself accountable for that stuff. Go back through that list. Did you, did you bring in a new product line? What, was, what were the things that you decided you were going to do? You were going to have a conversation with a publisher that matters. You were going to meet five retailers that you want as part of your retail network because that's super, super critical. Um, how much of that, of that goal sheet did you get accomplished? Was there anything critical on there that you missed? Prioritizing that list is super important. Looking at what that list is and making sure that the top part the, the three star stuff you got done. If the bottom part, you didn't get it done, but it's, it's less of an impact on your store. Or it doesn't have a big, um, you don't, you don't care that much about it. That doesn't matter, but you know, score your score, like take a look at what your goals were and what would you give yourself for the attendance in that show? And if there's areas to improve the time to look at that is right then go through take a look at what you missed or take a look at what you could have done better and make sure that you write something fresh down because then you've got it programmed into your head for the next time that you decide that you're going to get on a plane or you're going to get on a car and you're going to go somewhere and you're going to put yourself out as a professional in the industry and say, here I am, this is my business, this is what I want to do. How do I make those adjustments? And, you know, accomplishing goals is something that is more rewarding than anything else. And it's something that if you're not holding yourself accountable in a certain way, then you're just missing the boat when it comes to certain things. So that's my top seven. Honorable mention is going to be this. Take it slow. And what I mean by take it slow is try to implement one change a month in your store. There's a really famous article that I read a while back that was all about the person that took over Kmart. And Kmart was on a really good run. 
and they he did an interview and they talked to him about hey what you 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 guys are really doing well now you've gotten yourself out of you know the spot that you were in financially you're moving forward um what do you think it was that was the thing that really put you over was it the blue light special was it this that and the other thing and the guy's honest answer was we don't know we made so many changes that i don't know which ones were effective and which ones they weren't so my honorable mention and probably the most important one on the thing is when you go back to your store implement change one change at a time if you change one thing a month and you've changed 12 things in your store over the course of a year you're so far ahead of your competition that you'll be amazed at how much just implementing one thing measuring the success of that putting that into action explaining it to your staff and then circling back to that after the month and going did this was this successful yes or no do we need to change it okay everything's good then start with month two and do the month two thing and go from there slow growth is good growth if you're green you're growing if you're ripe you're rotting so you always want to be in growth constantly uh that's the show for today um thanks for hanging out please subscribe and like if you haven't Episode six is going to be March 13th. Uh, we're going to move the live show uh, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. While it's great for my friends in Paris and some of my East Coasters, it's not great for my potential West Coast customer and publishers out there. So depending on when Tennille, my lovely producer, decides that she wants lunch and that sort of stuff because I want her to have a, you know, I don't want her to be starving while we're in the middle of all this 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 production that we have going on. We'll probably look at moving to like, 1 p.m., 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, somewhere's in there, and um, that'll be when we come back from March 13th. And the topic that I'm going to have for the March 13th show is, why aren't there more CCGs for me to sell? So hopefully everybody will see some value in that. We'll talk about the CCG market, and we'll go from there. Uh, and I appreciate everybody for stopping by. Thanks.